call the finance. Okay, thank you. I'm going to call the uh, finance committee meeting of uh, May 3rd to order at two minutes after nine. And um, I just want to remind everybody that pursuant to chapter 20 of the acts of 2021, extended by chapter 22 of the acts of 2022, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to have access to the meeting can do so by Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public is being permitted, but every effort has been made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technology means and pursuant to um, the rules of the council and what we believe to be good practice, there will be an opportunity for public comment um, later in the meeting. Um, though I do have to note, um, uh, Athena, I think the public comment got left off the agenda. Do you, but I think we can do public comment anyway. Is that correct? Yes, that's, we're required to at a regular meeting, so you can go ahead. So we can go ahead in any, in any event, even though, okay. So um, we have um, four items on the agenda and uh, that are substantive items uh, for discussion. One is the opportunity for further questions and comments about the, uh, what we received last night in the budget. Second is um, where we need, want to spend a significant amount of time because it was not reviewed as um, um, completely as the budget was as a whole last night is the capital improvement plan and it is a specific item on the agenda. So those are two major items. The optional tax exemption I think is a fairly brief item in probably is 10 or 15 minutes of um, at most. Um, so we will do that later. And the other um, that we want to have time for is water sewer rates. And um, just a reminder that this is about the rates for FY23, which are being uh, were developed and are being proposed, have been proposed according to current policy um, that we have not changed the policy. That is a separate discussion that is uh, flows from this, but will be considered really as we um, get back to discussing the water sewer regulations. So uh, we can limit reference to that. So I guess that- um, And you need I, to call the meeting to order yeah, and take- roll. Yeah, I was just about to do that. Um, I'm gonna call the meeting to order. I want to that now make sure that it, um, everybody who's a finance committee member who's present uh, can be in, be heard and make sure we have the attendance. We just had our, uh, I think now our last member join. And then I will uh, turn it over to you, Lynn, to call the council to order. Um, so um, having said that, um, I think Lynn's already acknowledged her presence and we can testify that we heard her and uh, she's obviously hearing us, uh, Bob Hegner. I'm present. And uh, Ed Halloway. Present. Um, I think hey, Bernie, you Bernie Kubiak is not here. And uh, I don't know if he was accidentally in the attendee list, somebody can check. Uh, while I go through, um, Michelle Miller, yeah, and Kathy Shane, Kathy, you need to unmute and let us know. Still didn't hear you. Still, still muted. Unmuting. Okay, here. Okay. And uh, Alicia Walker. Here. Okay, so um, Lynn, back to you. 
for council. Given that we have a quorum of the council present, I'm going to call the town council meeting to order at uh, 9.08. And I want to check on those members that are here from the council, but not members of the finance committee. Let me begin with Pat DeAngelis. Present. Anna Devlin Gothier. Present. Uh, Pam Rooney. Here. Jennifer Taub. Present. I want to thank you all for appearing in alphabetical order on my screen. <laughs> um, so the way we will proceed is as we go through the meeting, um, any counselor or member of the finance committee uh, raising their hand uh, will be recognized in with best effort to make sure that it's in the order in which hands are raised. Uh, but uh, since it's a joint meeting, that is the practice that, as to how we proceed. Um, so I don't know if um, either Paul or um, Sean want to say anything additional about the budget. Otherwise, um, the next step will be to see if there are any um, additional questions that people wish to raise. And remember the capital improvement plan is a separate item. Andy, um, well, Paul, do, would you like to say anything? Okay. Um, Andy, I was just gonna, if it's helpful, do a quick recap of um, which finance committee members have which departments. Is that helpful just to quickly go through that um, one time? Uh, yes, we can do that. Okay, so just as a reminder, um, Matt Holloway has schools, Bernie Kubiak has the library, Alicia Walker has community services, which includes uh, recreation, Cherry Hill, pools, um, senior center, and veterans. Uh, Kathy Shane has public safety. Lynn Griesmer has enterprise funds and public works. Michelle Miller has general government. Um, and Bob Hegner has um, conservation planning and inspections. Um, so when you all dig into the, the larger budget document, those will be the areas that um, you would uh, generate questions uh, for, for the future committee meetings when those departments come. And the other thing that um, you might want to do is you had given some direction to department heads about how we're going to proceed as far as the amount of time for a uh, general overview being limited that, um, and uh, the amount of time you're generally allocating for departments depending upon size and complexity of budget. Yeah, um, because we have, you know, we wanna get through every department and we don't want to um, cut anybody short because we run out of time. Um, we've asked department has to keep their presentations very brief um, and not to just, not to read what's already written there, assume that that's been um, already digested. So really just to keep the remarks um, very high level and brief and then reserve most of the time for questions. Um, so the smaller departments have somewhere between 15 and 20 minutes, the large departments, you know, goes up a little bit from there. Um, and we do have a meeting, sort of a placeholder meeting at the very end where if we, if we do have to have an extra meeting to get through everybody, um, you know, we have that flexibility, but um, yeah, we've we've told department heads to try to keep that brief. And I guess the last thing, and then I'll uh, call on Matt since I see his hand is up. Uh, and that is that uh, we had said that uh, people who've been assigned departments will try and go through the department a little bit more thoroughly for the department to which they're assigned and do it a little bit earlier. And if you have any questions that you've identified at the beginning, um, if you can send them to Sean, he will he can forward them to the department head, and uh, creates a uh, um, extra opportunity for them to uh, do research. Yeah, yeah, just and that it helps make the process go faster too. If um, if there's a sort of preset list of questions that they can start with, um, that that's a nice way to sort of start each one off. So if you're assigned to a department try and, um, or a section, try and get to it a little bit earlier, it would be helpful for that reason, Matt? That, that's, that's most of what my question was, just the process that you wanted to follow, especially because as the new person, I'm also going first. So I wanted to 
make sure I met the expectations and also didn't exceed them. Um, but so so then if I had questions about somebody else, a particular other department, would I pass that along to the um, finance committee member who's who's investigating it, or should I just wait for the meeting? You know, like how how collaborative is this preliminary review? Um, trying to think about that because we really not. If you know of a question and you think that it's going to uh, might require some additional work, it's not something um, that can be answered just quickly um, off the top of somebody's head and might require research. I would say at least forward it to Sean yeah. because he can make that judgment better than uh, the rest of us can. Kathy? Uh, yeah, and if you know, to a certain extent, um, I remember when Bob and I both split public works and public enterprise, we came up with similar questions, although we didn't see each other's and Sean then consolidated them. Um, you know, I, I thought it would have been more efficient if we could have shared them with each other, you know, so that, but, but I don't know whether there's a way of doing that, if it's just straight questions, Andy. Um, uh, so, maybe it'll work fine. Um, so I'll, I'll just leave it at that because Sean did a nice job of pulling them together so that the department was only answering one set. Yeah. Okay. So um, I guess at this point, then we should just uh, open it up and see if um, people have questions that they've thought of since last night. And for uh, Matt and Bob, it's their first opportunity about the uh, operating budget before we turn it over to the capital improvement plan. Uh, Bob. Yeah, um, I, I didn't really have a chance to read through the entire document, but I did uh, kind of come just have some general sort of questions and comments. The first, mostly on the introductory pieces on page six of on public safety. Uh, from what I see described, I, I do think these are very sound investments and I support them. But I do think, you know, what we've discussed in the past is we need to keep our eyes open on costs in the out years because some of this is being funded through ARPA and other things. So we just have to keep an eye on that. And I know that Paul, you and, and, and Sean and, and Tonya are well aware of that. Um, on page seven, sustainability, um, the focus there is on climate change, which is fine. But I mean, what I've tried to say in the past is we also need to think about sustainability of the town budgets and the town finances uh, going forward. So the decisions we make today have impacts on the future. And so I think that should be part of, um, of how we approach the, the budget uh, uh, season or the budget process. Um, page eight on housing and homelessness. Um, I want to put in a plug here for what Dorothy Pam had been pushing in when she was on the finance committee. And I, I think to the extent that's feasible, the town should look for ways to promote home ownership, not just promoting affordable housing in the sense of rental properties. I think that you know a a more permanent solution is to figure out ways we can leverage town finances to help uh, with uh, to promote home ownership. Um, on page eight, infrastructure. Um, I think it would be helpful to get a a report on the uh, siting of the new DPW facility, where we stand in the process. It's been ongoing for quite some time um, and it's kind of holding things up. Um, and then again, on a, it'd be helpful to have an update on where we are, the budgets are in terms of the four major infrastructure projects in relation to, to the original budgets that we had, county inflation and, and the new information that we've, we've, we've had since whenever we discussed it last. Um, and then finally, on page eight, economic development. I think um, I, I really support strengthening the strategic agreements with universities and the colleges. And um, 
especially if we can get an increased support from them. Um, and to the extent that it's feasible, if we could get some information on where we stand on these agreements, um, they may be, I understand if we can't because there are works in progress uh, and there may be sensitivity to that, but if to the extent that we can, that would be helpful. And that's what I have for now, thanks. Okay. Um, before I go on, uh, let's see if either Paul or Sean have a um, anything you want to respond to at this point about Bob's uh, questions. Yeah, um, I'll just say all good points um, in terms of st strategic agreements. Yes, those are in progress, so we can't um, give specifics, but they are actively um, uh, occurring in those conversations right now. Um, I think there is a plan to provide an update in the near future on the DPW site, um, Paul, right? Um, and then I think, yeah, your other comments were, were right on, so. Um, in the, including the update on the major buildings, which you've talked about with the council, I think. Yeah, I'll just quickly add to that one. So, so we are planning to do another update. Um, one piece of information we're waiting for to make it sort of a meaningful update is the reimbursement rate from um, the MSBA for the school project, um, or or getting closer to having an idea what that reimbursement rate is, because that will um, make a big impact on what the the debt exclusion request is and and what the impact is on taxpayers. Um, so that's one reason why we haven't updated as we're waiting to get that information. Okay, um, we go on and uh, Matt. Thanks, Andy. These might be two really very simple questions, but I, I would appreciate um, if you kind of answer them and, and then give me like a little bit of the background behind them as well. So, so one is just, um, and this is very simple. I, I noticed the 5.1% increase, you know, this year. Um, and I was just wondering if that is, so I, I know it's a 2.5 on the operating so is that 5.1 reflective of um, ARPA funds, ARPA spending, you know, and if so, what does that look like for the, for the longer term? Um, so that's question one. And then question two is just, um, just I, I, you know, I was happy to see, you know, the kind of reference to the prudent reserves and the 21 million as 25% of the operating um, budget and all that. And I was just wondering if that's, if that's a, uh, I, I'm sure it is an established like municipal best practice somewhere. Is there, you know, is there a published guide? Are there published guidelines around, you know, municipal best practice for amounts held in reserve against, you know, annual budgets? That's just, you know, so so just simple simple questions. But then if you want to expand a little bit on on just the general thinking on that, I'd appreciate it. Sure. Um, so the five point one percent is partially driven by. Uh, the pandemic. So that's not, I wouldn't say that's a normal annual increase. Um, there were a couple of years uh, starting FY21 where revenues were reduced because of the pandemic, where we, local receipts were reduced. Um, as we've started to come out of that, those revenues have been growing faster than they typically would. And so that supported larger budget increases. Um, and also during those years, we had lower operating budget increases to, to kind of offset the, the lower revenues. Um, so the 5.1% um, is a combination of local receipts coming in faster uh, or coming in at higher increases than usual um, and some of our other um, other financing source areas coming in. Um, it also includes a one-time, uh, not a one-time, but a planned use of reserves that adds into that uh, mix, a planned use of reserves to support the four building projects. Um, so that makes that increase a little higher than normal. So I, I would say that's not typical, but the past couple of years, that increase has been higher because of um, recovery. Um, and I imagine it will hopefully continue for at least one more year, uh, one or two more years where we'll see continued recovery and revenues that will boost up that increase. Um, on the expense side, uh, we have the two and a half percent for operating budgets, but the, the area that's really um, taken on a big chunk of that 5.1% is capital because we reduced capital um, dramatically during the pandemic. And so we went from, I think it was eight and a half percent of the levy in FY22 up to 10% of the levy for FY23. Um, so we, a big chunk of that increase went to investing in capital and meeting that goal. Um, to your second question about reserves. So 
Um, there's no exact number that I've seen. It's sort of what each community um, determines is prudent. We've worked on policies with this committee um, where we just updated the reserve uh, level, I think from 15 to 25%. So we're sort of at the upper end of that. Um, we've, uh, you know, in large part to Sonia's uh, planning, um, built up our reserves intentionally to support the four billion projects. And in this budget, we're starting to see the the, the results of that. We're able to pull some of those reserves to support the Jones Library debt payment. Um, so we are sort of the upper end of the, the band of what we want our reserves to be, but that might creep up a little bit more as we continue to plan for these four building projects because we, we see that costs are rising when it comes to construction pretty rapidly. Um, so yeah, reserves are healthy, but we do have these large projects on the horizon that we need to be mindful of. Not on the horizon, you know, on the right down the road, um, whatever, the, whatever the opposite of horizon is, so, uh, com, <laughs> right. coming up, coming up very soon. So. Right, right. A 12 inch rule. Yeah. Um, th thank you very much. And I just, I want to say, by the way, last night sitting in on, on that, the presentation was really fabulous uh, and to, to both of you and to everybody on the staff, just thank really you. outstanding um, and, and helpful for, you know, a, a new person. Thanks, Sean. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, just one observation on the point you raised about the 5.1% increase. Uh, we are sort of in this um, odd period where we're coming out of the uh, recession uh, that happened with the pandemic. And uh, it may be helpful if you need to measure to measure against the year prior. Like uh, if you go back to um, FY20, and see where we are in comparison to FY20 and get a better sense as to whether they're really how we're going because what we want to get back to is we want to get back to the year that uh, was unaffected. Um, Anna, you had your hand up and then took it down, so I'm assuming that... Um, it's a minor comment, no worries. Okay, um, Kathy? Uh, thank you. Um, I've tried to build on the comments that came before um i you know i i too appreciate the presentation and my one concern is i feel like we're often more positive uh than when i really look forward and see what we're facing i i think there are real challenges so i'll just go first to the four large projects um sean said we're holding off on updating until we hear from msba but we have a pretty good sense of the range of that match. Um, and the actual elementary school building, we have good indication of where it's gonna come in as a price tag and it's above what we had hoped it would because of what's happening out in the construction industry and the pipelines. So I think we need to visit sooner rather than later the whole notion that we can do all four. We are still carrying both DPW and the fire to go out for about $35 million in debt financing of both of them. And we've got the news of the school coming before us as a council by the end of this year in terms of what the Amherst share will be. So I, I think we may really have to go to the drawing boards and say, let's take a hard look at all of this. If you look at the capital budget, uh, Paul and the entire staff, Sonia uh, and Sean, have done a great job of giving us a balanced capital budget this year, an almost really, I'll call it balanced next year. And then we're in deficit if we try to meet what we've said or our obligation, you know, that we really want to. So we, we, Bob's been talking before, we need to keep looking at all of these in a multi year framework. So for the operating budget, we've moved ARPA money in to start up a major new department. Um, that doesn't look as healthy in terms of, if you look out a couple of years. Uh, so just trying to think of how we both focus on this year's budget and then be thinking about consequences and sustainability, I think will be really important. And my only other question, I, I flagged it last night. I would like to figure out how we carve out a little bit of time to talk about the ARPA money. The one item that caught my attention last night, because I remember discussion on everything else was the Youth Empowerment Center for $500,000. Um, it's a large amount of money. I'm not sure 
what is being thought of there, but I thought my last memory of that it was on the potential ask list, but not on the yes, do it list. So I don't know when it moved, when it shifted from potential to yes. And the reason I'm asking about it is, you know, how we staff that, does it have an operating budget? Um, how does that interact with uh, ARPA, potential use of ARPA money for the elementary school? Um, we can, if the spend out, reserving some of that for what we might need to do with the school, what um, is important. So I'd like to carve out some time to talk about that and to talk about what we're doing about the not yet allocated ARPA funds to be advanced, think about advanced planning. And I think I'll just stop there because I'm concerned about the multi-year. The staff is bringing us a really good solid FY23. Um, and it then starts to not look as much, if I think about the real operating budgets, you know, as opposed to we say it's only going to go up two and a half percent a year. But if we have people underneath that, where where's the money coming from? So I think I'll stop right there. Yeah, can I, can I respond to that, Andy? Sure. Yeah. Um, so I think you're right, Kathy. The long, obviously, you are right. The the long view is is vitally important. There is a five year projection um, in there, so take a look at that. Um, you'll see that next couple of year or next year looks okay. You start to see some gaps in the future, which I don't think is is unusual because we we do try to lean conservative when we do these projections. Um, I think everything you said is is one reason why it's it's really important to keep the revenue side of the equation in mind as we. Um, as the town grows and we want to continue to do things, that revenue piece is really important. Um, it's also a reason why, as we talk about new initiatives and, and new things, um, we just have to be mindful of how are we going to pay it and how are we going to sustain the things that we have going on currently. Um, we've, we take, uh, we've got a new Crest department, a new DEI department. Um, we got these four building projects and there's a lot going on. And so, um, yeah, we just have to kind of keep the, the big picture and what's going on currently and how we can maintain it. Um, I think one, I think on the Youth Empowerment Center, you may be mixing up the capital improvement program with the ARPA funds. So in the capital improvement program, you're right, the Youth Empowerment Center is in the, um, the pending list. Remember, we created that pending section in the capital improvement program that says, this is a project on our radar, but we don't yet know how to fund it. And so we do have the Youth Empowerment Center in that section of the capital improvement program. Um, but in terms of ARPA, it's been on the, it has been part of that round one spending um, since we presented it back in November, I believe. Um, and so 500,000, again, at this point, we don't know what the youth, um, we don't know what that would go towards, if it would be a, a new site, a renovated site, um, a contract with an outside vendor to provide a youth empowerment center. We're really in the very preliminary stages of just doing a needs assessment um, to figure out what type of uh, needs a youth empowerment center would fill and, and then uh, conducting a feasibility study to see how the town could do that. Um, so it's very early in the in the process for that. I'm just saying that it might be too early because if we if we do get the school, you know, let's just be positive that yeah. we'll have a vacant school. Um, so trying to think about we have a big property and you'll see in the capitalist we have other properties that we're not using so we should be thinking about how we repurpose the school that is vacated so some of it may be to do a lot of feasibility a lot of thinking when there is a big one uh, that's not going to be available best guess would be 2026 uh, i don't think we should waste a dollar of opera money we should really put it to productive use um, wherever we can. So my memory is faulty on that one. And just the one other thing I forgot to say that I wanted to say with Bob about the um, strategic agreements. I think the way we approach, particularly the wealthy Amherst College, is going to be really important for the school. And I don't, I would like to to have a different kind of discussion, not necessarily just in the finance committee about a big ask from them. And I don't know whether there are alums we can uh, get together and saying, you know, if it's a one-time big ask, it's not just a long-term agreement, but we have um, a school we need to fund. So I, I just think we need to think big about some of the high ticket items and I'll stop. Uh, do you have anything else to say, Sean or Paul, on that? Because uh, I, 
think that it's raised several good points that I have uh, sort of an, in general principle felt for years, which is if you're thinking about a building, you also have to think about who's going to work in the building and uh, whether there are uh, operating costs that follow. The best example always was when the discussion was creating a third fire station as opposed to just rent, uh, moving the fire station. The operating costs of operating a third fire station became a discussion way back when in the finance committee, back in the former finance committee under our former form of government. And uh, you had to think about both sides. And I think, you know, that that principle doesn't go away. I think another example is that if you're going to add positions uh, in one year's budget, you have to be able to figure out how to sustain them, which is certainly an elementary school question that I have about if you add back um, arts uh, staffing, for example, can you sustain that in future years? And uh, I think long-term, not just think one year. So. Uh, yeah, and, and just to reiterate again on, on the Youth Empowerment Center, we're not even at that place of a, a space or people or staffing. Um, we're really at the, the phase of, um, is there a need for it, and and what would the what type of need is there for it? And so the recreation director is going to be working with um, stakeholders, doing surveys, meeting with families to you know to to first identify what it is that we need um, before we even get into the space conversation or, or staffing conversation. Okay, uh, Michelle. I think this is a question for Paul or Sean. Um, do we have a way with? I know there's this the procurement process um, and we have these four buildings that we're trying to these four projects. Do we have a way to get economies of scale like by trying to, you know, put more than one project together to get better pricing or is, is that something that the town thinks about? Yeah, um, I think. You know, with the library and the school, it's difficult because they're part of grant programs and they were on separate timelines and you've really got to follow those timelines. Um, I think with the fire station and DPW, it's something that could be explored further. Um, again, it depends on the DPW site and how the, the staging works, um, but I think it's more um, possible for, for those two, two building projects. Okay. Anything else on the operating budget? Because otherwise I want to... Uh get us along to the capital improvement plan. So I'll give it a moment to see if anybody else has a question now. So um, Paul or Sean, you wanna start anything off about an introduction to the um, CIP? Sure, um, I don't know, is it helpful, Andy, if I bring it up and just cover the highlights of it or um, not? No, go ahead, yes. Okay. Um, so capital improvement program, um, this is just what's in the town charter um, about capital. This just gives a little background um, and a little narrative. This section is about the timeline and, and the joint capital planning committee's role in reviewing the capital improvement program. Um, so I think this page is probably the most important uh, in terms of this year, but also if you're looking at the long view. So the way this page works is the top half are the resources available for capital um, and the bottom half are the expenses or the outflows. So the shaded gray column is the FY23, which is at zero and it, because it, it needs to be balanced. Um, and then you can see the out years where there's different uh, degrees of, of variances. Um, so the way that we start this is we look at the tax levy and we set a percentage of the tax levy dedicated to capital. So for FY23, it's 10%. Um, this year for the first time, and again, to support the four building projects, we have uh, projected reserves as a resource as well. Um, Community Preservation Act debt, it, it runs through the general fund. So we have to include it, but it's a in and out. So you don't have to worry about that very much. Uh, Comcast funding, um, in their agreement with Comcast, um, there's a certain amount of funding that comes in to help pay for the municipal fiber project. 
And um, so this will recur every year and it just goes towards the debt for that municipal fiber, um, but it comes in as a resource. This other is a combination of a few different, uh, really two different things. So um, the ambulance fund, as I mentioned last night, because we raise fees and um, activity is returned to normal, it's uh, healthy enough to support a um, ambulance purchase. So in this number um, is the purchase of a new ambulance and the payment for some uh, EMS equipment. Uh, I think it, the total of that is about 410,000 or so. And then there's an, the other 100,000 is the repurposed capital um, from prior years that's gonna be used to uh, help fund that capital um, the cost escalation reserve. Um, so those are considered other because they're not part of the, the current cash capital. They're either prior year capital or it's coming from the, the ambulance fund. And then each year we get chapter 90 money and um, that comes in as state aid. Okay, I just Next. mentioned something. Yep. Uh, so that, just to note that the 10% cash capital is based on the prior year's levy limit just because mm -hmm. it makes it easier for planning. Uh, I think Sonia introduced that a couple of years ago. To, so that was, we didn't have to reject. We knew exactly what that number would be. Right. Um, this next column is borrowing. So if there's any proposed borrowings, it comes in as a, as a, a resource for that year. Um, and then it flows into the projected debt in the future. Um, and then you go down to the next sec section, which are the outflows. So the first thing we do is we subtract any actual debt we have. Um, and this includes the, um, this is really anything that's been authorized, whether it's the actual borrowing has happened. If it's been authorized, we either we put it in here, um, either an actual debt schedule or a um, our projected debt schedule. Uh, projected debt would be for things that aren't authorized yet um, that still need approval. Um, and what we put in there for now is an estimate of interest for um, short-term borrowings because we know we have so many short-term borrowings each year. So we put in a, a estimate for interest, and then. Um, I don't know if I mentioned this, in this actual debt, the regional assessment is included in that number. So when we talk about the track project last night and some of these other uh, projects at the region, eventually they will flow into this actual debt number um, as, a cap, as a debt assessment from the region. And then whatever's left over after that um, becomes available for new projects, which is in, for this year, it's the 4.36 uh, million number. And then down below is if there's any other, um, if, if there's any other funding sources, they're also, uh, they show up as expenses in that area. So the other for the ambulance funds and the cost escal escalation reserve, and then the state aid. Um, so as we go into the out years, you can see there's um, continued proposed use of reserves. That's consistent with the plan um, that we presented um, a year or two ago for the four building projects. Again, this will be updated as when we update that model. Um, you'll also see estimated debt exclusion payments um, for the school project that will also be updated as we um, as we update the model. Um, I think yeah, I think that's it. And so the, the thing to know that we that we said um, during that presentation a couple of years ago is once the school uh, the four building projects come on, the amount of money we have for new projects starts to go down. Um, and so we've been trying to invest heavily in roads and heavily in some other infrastructure items because we know once those four building projects, um, once the debt hits, this, num this number available for new projects right here, you can see it's 4.3 this year. It drops down to 3.2, 2.8, 2.4. It'll bottom out around that 2.4 or so. Um, and then it'll slowly start to go back up. Um, but it, it does mean for a certain period of time, we're gonna have less money for new projects. Um, the other thing to note is that this is all based on getting to 10.5% for cash capital. We're at 10% this year, so we have one more step to go for the FY24 budget. Um, and I think the last thing I'll say, and I'll see if there's questions, is so this borrowing for this year, it looks like a large number, and it's because um, we have tentatively in there the DPW, if, if that site is selected next year and we would come back to the council, um, we're not proposing anything currently, but we, we figure that could happen FY23, so it's, it's in that number. Um, and the other uh, item in there is the school. So the school project will come up for a vote theoretically in the spring of 2023, so that would fall in FY23. Um, that this number, the, the exact number that will be requested is going to change when we get more information from the MSBA. So this is just 
um, this is based on the prior planning, um, but just so people are aware that the, the school project may come up for a vote in FY23 um, and the uh, DPW might come up in FY23. And I will stop there. Okay. Um, I know that there was somebody who had a hand up and took it down and I'm just going to assume that that was done purposefully and got a lend. Thanks, Andy. Um, so first of all, I want to just explain, I did not ask broad questions on the um, budget, operating budget, but we'll have my questions as we go forward into each of the departments. Um, the On the operating, I feel like we're asking to, you know, get blood from a stone. Uh, and it's really, it's bothering me that we make some progress on things like streets and sidewalks, and then we're really not going to be able to continue that progress. And so I don't know whether there's any creative solutions on how to continue on that. I know from my constituents, I hear about that, particularly people who are not on main roads. Uh, and I, I found the presentation that TSO uh, had on streets and uh, so forth to be just absolutely fa fantastic. I mean, for those of us who have ever thought the DPW didn't follow a plan, uh, if you watch that presentation, it will disabuse you of the fact that we follow a plan. Um, but I really want to figure out whether there is any way for us to continue throughout this process of the four major capital projects, which I'm incredibly committed to, um, that's no political secret. Um, the, but, you know, what else can we be doing to make sure we're not going to end up with old vehicles, further deterioration than we already have on sidewalks and roads and that kind of thing. So I, I'm, I'm concerned about those out years. I know in the past, we looked at those out years and it would often look like what it looks like now. Um, the problem now is that we've really made an attempt to try to um, be much more thoughtful in a five-year plan uh, through uh, the staff planning and also through JCPC. So I'm very concerned about those out years. Thank you. Paul, Sean, if, if you have no response, I'll go ahead and call on Kathy. Yeah, I mean, I'll just, I think Lynn's right on where there, there's going to be some belt tightening in those years. And that's sort of what we predicted when, you know, when we proposed taking on all four projects within, you know, a 10 year time frame. Okay, Kathy, and then Pam staff to that. Hey, Kathy? Uh, yeah. I mean, Sean showed you all the picture um, and it was a lot of numbers there, but the big one to see what he was talking about is that huge drop down on the money left for everything else. And if you think of we've been trying to spend $2 million on roads and sidewalks, which is both the chapter 90 money, we get almost a million out of that, but we're dropping precipitately and then we just heard about the ambulance and I guess we will hear more at some point, but should we be on an eight year rather than 10 year replacement cycle? Um, and that given that ambulances are coming in much more expensive. Um, so, so there's, it's, it's, it's what I said earlier when Lynn said getting blood out of a stone, I just think we've got, it, it's not a rosy picture looking forward, even if we can, it's not balanced by 2025, it's not balanced. And, and what you can see with the big buildings coming on, if you look on the debt line, Jones coming on is a million this coming year. And then it jumps by another million. And page 29, the, the, night, the staff has really done us a favor. You get the debt. If we do everything we intend on doing, you get the debt obligations by what we're borrowing. So that's 20, 29, it's the last page of the report, gives you that picture of when each of those hit, what it does um, to his people. So I, I just think we, I think we need 
a more focused discussion on this. So I'm just opening this to not say we have to solve it. 2023 is a done deal. One question I do have though, is Sean, during JCPC uh, meeting, you said uh, the Jones debt, depending on what was decided about the building with the new news, you might not go out to incur that debt in this fiscal year. Meaning if it doesn't incur it before June, then it doesn't hit FY23, it hits FY24. Um, right. So I don't know when we'll know that because you can see what it's doing in the budget, the capital budget, it's doing two things. One, it's a big increase of expenditure in FY23, but it's also pulling down $500,000 from reserves. Um, so we wouldn't need to do that. That would sit in reserves. I just think there's a, I know you can't answer that right now, but it-, it No, it, I, I can. That's a, that's a good question, actually. It's a good, um, it's a good yeah. question to um, make people aware of. So, so that's been one of our uh, needly points uh, of, that we've been dealing with lately. Um, so we've decided not to borrow um, this June. So we are, we're not gonna go out and permanently borrow for that library project. There's just um, interest rates have been creeping up anyway. So the, it's not like we're at historic lows anymore. Um, and we just wanna see how things go forward a little bit. So so we're, we've delayed that to the fall. So we may still borrow, permanently borrow in the fall if interest rates look um, seem favorable at that time. And, and um, we feel better about the, uh, when the construction is going to start for that project. So um, again, some of it's how far in advance of construction do we borrow? And we don't want to borrow too far in advance of construction. So we've delayed that to the fall. Um, we've talked with our financial advisor. We can still structure a debt payment to be an FY23 if we borrow in the fall. So um, so that's why we've included it here because that still may happen. Um, if for whatever reason it doesn't happen, uh, we would we would come back to the council and there'd be some changes. Um, we wouldn't use the stabilization funds, for example. Um, we might not borrow for the Crocker Farm Gym pro project that, that was proposed as a borrowing. We might take that off the borrowing list. So we would repurpose that, um, that projected debt payment in a way that made sense. Um, so it's in there for now. Um, and if for whatever reason we didn't need to make it next year, we would repurpose it for other stuff. Um, and we would do it in a way that doesn't increase cost, but just we wouldn't use reserves and we wouldn't borrow for other projects. Okay, that's great. It, and could you just say a little bit about the ladder truck? Because that was a, a quick discussion we had that you were going to look into it more. The We agreed that we wanted the ladder truck, but our ladder truck is different than the ladder truck that Northampton purchases. And the difference in price is $500,000. So you were going to have yeah, a let me, somewhat I, longer. Just We had a quick discussion. I won't call it quick, but we had a quick discussion at JCPC and that was left for the department to look into more. Yeah, um, so we talked to the fire department about that and they wrote a very thoughtful um, letter memo um, explaining the the need for the platform ladder truck and how it's, um, what the benefits are of it and how it's very different than a stick ladder truck that doesn't have the platform on top. Um, so let, so they're at, so, what we're proposing still is the platform ladder truck in large part based on um, their advocacy. So let me forward, I think I can forward that letter to you all just so you can see they laid out very clearly um, the differences between the two vehicles, the one purchased in Northampton and, and this one um, and what the benefits are of this one. Uh, Cause there's other, there's other differences in that price besides just the platform and the ladder. There's um, one requires a different truck and, and, and so on. So I'll, I'll make sure I forward that to the committee. And That'd be great because it was, it was just startling to see this the two at the same time and realize that different towns or cities, whatever we are, approach this differently, and there's a price tag difference um, in it. Since yeah, thanks. Yeah, I, th I think that's a good point, Kathy. That there are a lot of um, our, our what are identified needs and wants, and and it's we are getting to the point where we, we really need to be much more um, critical of those decisions as we make them. And just to note that on, on the ambulance, that any ambulance funds, uh, any ambulance replacement has to come from the ambulance fund. If there aren't fund, if there aren't there's if there isn't money in the ambulance fund, um, I know the the desire is to accelerate the replacement schedule, but that means the funds have to be in the ambulance fund to support that. And if the funds aren't there, it's really hard to do. So I think we have a lot, our departments are trying to be cutting, you know, cutting edge and right on the, you know, doing the right thing for their departments. And then it comes to this body and to the 
elected um, finance and manager's office to help make these sort of overall decisions for the town. Okay, uh, Pam. Thanks. Uh, Kathy's question actually uh, highlighted a little bit of what I was trying to find. And that was where the expenses and the outlays for the debt for the capital projects start to show up in, in our uh, accounting. <clears throat> now I know I need to go look at page 29. So thank you for that. Um, uh, the conversation about um, borrowing for the Jones or borrowing for any project, uh, is it your plan to borrow in increments? Because we know that uh, over the course of a two or three year construction sequence, not all the money goes out at one time. And so um, is there a plan or is it possible in fact to borrow in increments as the need comes up. So you're you're essentially borrowing for pre-construction, then you're borrowing for construction. Um, uh, that's just a, a comment. Yeah, um, so you, you can borrow in increments and, and I would say that's probably the typical way we would do it. Um, when we first started working on the, when I, when I first started working on the MBLC project, um, we heard from some people at the MBLC that uh, described a project they'd recently worked on where the town had borrowed um, had um, borrowed their share up front, all of their share up front, um, locked in a low interest rate. And then they had, they, every year you receive grant money from the MBLC. And so they were able to take that money, set it aside, earn a return on that, and then dedicate that return back into the project. And they said for, for that particular town, that worked really well for them because they were able to lock in that low interest rate and start making payments on it. And then also generate a return on this money. Cause a lot of times you're not able to do that, but with MBLC they they provide that flexibility. Um, so that was one path we were looking at a lot of, as we go forward, you know, whether we borrow in increments or borrow in and borrow it all in one lump sum, it'll depend on what we think interest rates are doing. Um, if we think interest rates are rising, then we would want to borrow it all at once because um, we, we don't want to lock in higher interest rates in the future. Um, if we think interest rates are uncertain um, or, or potentially going down, then we would want to borrow as little as possible um, and try to get lower rates in the future. Um, and so we do all of that with the help of um, a financial advisor. We have had a, a Unibank as our, the firm we work with, and we've had a financial advisor, David Eisenthal, um, who's, I think he's made presentations to this, this committee in the past, and, and he, he's happy to any time in the future. Um, but we work with him a lot to sort of try to, uh, you know, make the right decision that saves the town the most money. Great, thank you. There's a whole process of uh, at times issuing bond anticipation notes and then lumping the notes together into a major borrowing later in a project. Uh, I've never quite understood how the decision is made, but trust that it's being made by people who are giving the right advice and know how to make those decisions. Uh, Lynn? Yeah, I just want to make sure that uh, when the fire department or any other department for that matter comes before us for their operating budget, if we have capital questions, we can include those in those operating, in those discussions. Because, at, <coughs> excuse me, because at that time, we have the people who have provided you with the feedback, for example, on the ladder truck. Uh, and I just, want to mention to and make sure that we all understand that to be the case so we can ask capital questions when they come forward on operating. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, so Sean, you want to keep going? Sure. Um, I don't have too much more, but maybe since it got brought up a couple times, I'll just, um, so hold on, sorry if this makes people sick, but um, so the next few sections, there's the um, breakdown of the actual project. So you can see the... the but we're um, not seeing anything actually. Oh, you're not seeing anything on the screen yet? Yep. Still nothing? Oh, I even clicked it, that's why, sorry. Um, now you will. <laughs> um, so you'll see here that there's the breakdown of the projects and the different years and what the, the cost estimates are. Um, 
here's the funding source. So if it says cash capital, that means it would come out of that new project money bucket. If it says borrowing, then, then we're proposing a borrowing for it. Um, state aid, uh, and then there's an other category if it would come out of an amp, um, the ambulance fund or some other source like here for the, for the ambulance. Um, there's descriptions of each project. We tried to note which ones we thought um, would have a, a impact on sustainability and improving um, the town's progress towards meeting the, some of the goals in the CARP. Um, so Kathy described this a little bit earlier. We, we added a section that talks about um, some projects that are not on the plan, but are on our radar. Um, we broke them into two different buckets last year at the, uh, based on feedback from the Joint Capital Planning Committee. So this first bucket are projects that um, they're sort of ready to go or they're, or they're close to ready to go. It's really a, a matter of funding. And, um, and if a grant came through or something came through for these, then we would move on them pretty quickly. Um, the second lit section are, are sort of needs have been identified, but um, still just need more analysis and, and discussion about um, whether they should go up into this next phase, um, this next bucket. Um, we, there's some information in here on asset maintenance. So you can see what it costs to maintain the buildings, uh, utilities, and things of that nature. Um, same thing for vehicles. You can see what we spend on um, fuel and um, supplies. Uh, we have the statuses of pr projects approved in the past. So this is that outstanding list. So we do anything that's three years or older, we put on this list. So I think it's everything FY19 and um, earlier. So if there's anything, you'll see a little status update. Um, and again, as, as Lynn mentioned, these are things that are fair to ask when the department heads come up, um, if you wanna ask on a particular project for an update. Um, then we have our inventory section and we got a lot of feedback from Joint Capital Planning, uh, from the Joint Capital Planning Committee and also from um, Anna made some good comments about ways to uh, make this more helpful or, or more useful in the future. So we'll continue to try to uh, improve this as we go forward. And then the last thing is the, the debt schedule. Um, hold on, it's uh, should update in a second. There we go. Um, the debt schedule. So we put in the projects, uh, this gray area or projects approved in the general fund. The yellow section are things that are proposed this year and future years. So these are not approved yet. They're, these are projected. Uh, we have approved CPA projects um, because that debt flows through uh, the capital improvement program. We have the regional debt assessment. So I, I mentioned this um, at some previous meeting that we are projecting an increase in the regional debt assessment. So you can see we're at 388 uh, for FY23. We're proposing that will go up, um, that will go up to 800,000 in the future. Um, and that's really an estimate. The number that the region has pro proposed would go much higher than that. Um, and what I've said to them is that we need to, have, there needs to be more conversation about what the town of Amherst can support in terms of a regional um, debt assessment before we would go all the way up to their number. Uh, and then the four building projects, uh, an estimate is here as well. And that is the capital improvement program. So Matt, I see your hand up. This might, <clears throat> thank you, Andy. This might be a really simple one. Um, the road paving line, the, uh, this, the appendix B, the um, debt schedule, mm -hmm. very helpful to me just to um, kind of at a glance. So thank you for that. Um, mm -hmm. And the road paving item, just can you explain how that works? So it's a total amount is a million and then there's 101 for FY23 and then blanks throughout the rest of the line. Yeah, so that was, um, so we, we don't, typically borrow for road paving anymore. Um, several years ago, I don't know, Sonia or Paul might know better, um, there was a large borrowing done for road paving. Um, and so the total amount that was borrowed at that time was a million and FY23 is the last year that that's being paid off. So that's for paving that was done a long time ago. Um, okay. And then we're not, we don't have any proposals to borrow for road paving in the future. Okay, great, thank you. The uh, borrowing was done when John Musanti was the town manager and uh, he thought it was a good way to get a uh, lead on getting a bunch of road work that had gotten behind done uh, but uh, 
we've had some discussion since, and I, uh, Paul can speak for himself on this, or, but I think what uh, he's pointed out is just that it puts us in a position of uh, paying for roads over time that may exceed the usability of the road that has been repaired. Um, Bob? Yeah, as I, um, as I mentioned earlier, I didn't have much of a chance to, to read carefully through this document, but one thing just hit me. It's on page 17. Um, it's a, a line item for creating new shelving units for the special collection at the library. And I think it was on the order of $49,000. It just seems to me like since we're going to be packing up the library, why, do we, why don't we just pack this up? And put it in storage, and when the new library is ready, we can we'll have the space for it. I mean, just seems like it's it's a ridiculous waste of money to get new shelving and then just move it. Uh, so anyway, that was just a thought. Yeah, there there was a lot of discussion on that one because um, you know for the same reason that you identified, Bob, um, and I can't remember now the but uh, the. Uh, the explanation that the librarians had, but we can get that and forward to you. Um, it has, again, this has to do specifically with the special collections, which are in a room right now that um, is that, you know, they don't feel is a good uh, safe for the special collection. So this would be to get them out of there. Um, and they said this could also be used in the new Jones library in the future. So it's not like a buy it once and then it's gonna never be used again. Um, but let me see if I can track down, they, they wrote a, a more robust response to this because the same question was asked. John, I have it up. Oh, good. Okay. If that's help, would it, is that help? Do you want me to just forward it to you right now or do you want me to read from it? Um, if you wanna summarize the, the, what they said, that's fine with me. Yeah, so this is um, mobile shelving and it can be reused in the new building. Um, and so my question, Bob, initially about this was that they had come to CPA for a request for shelving a couple of years back, and that was for more permanent shelving. Um, and this is really for the, this is in order to move their most at-risk collections out of the storage room because the storage room is um, so unstable that it's damaging the special collections. So it will be reused um, in the new building. And uh, it is one of the issues is that they don't have a, a safe place. They need to move it. They need the shelving in order to move those um, special collection things. Uh, and yeah, so they said the shelves are less durable for the mobile, but because it's appropriate to, to be able to move things around. Sean, did I get those right or did I mix up the CPA and the- uh, No, I think- I think you got it right. And again, this would be another question. I think when um, the library comes on the 12th, um, they can give a better, um, you know, they can explain it better. Yeah. Thank you, Anna. Did you have anything else? If not, uh, Kathy, and, uh, Kathy when, uh, if you have anything to report as having been chair of JCPC about the process, that would be helpful. And one question that I might uh, ask you to consider is uh, whether the um, inventory um, that was provided at the beginning of the year is uh, pursuant to that section of the charter, whether it provided the help you needed. There was a little bit of reference to that earlier, but if you have anything more to say on it. So, yeah. Okay, Eddie, the, that was my, I'll, I'll do both things. I, I would, had my hand up on inventory, but I'll just add one thing on the bookshelves. Um, we didn't ask Bob's question, which is a good one. Of why not just put some of this in boxes and store it? Um, what, what they're going to give up their exhibit room completely in the library and put the shelving, turn it into a different storage room because the library is not going to open for a few years. So it leaves the exhibit the special collections makes them accessible. So the idea was mobile mobile units move the whole thing and give up a room for what they're using it now. So on, on inv um, two things, I'll respond to yours, Andy. Uh, what the staff team has done has been amazing on, for JCPC. They, they're coming to us with a very robust set of information 
that is responsive and organized in ways we've asked for it in the past. So, in, so it's it's I think of it an evolving document. You saw what John told about the capital projects that aren't on the list that are potentially coming on the list. That was a new feature that was added. The debt schedule showing all of it on that page, Pam. That was a new feature that was added the uh, appropriated but not spent <laughs> looking backwards um, don't have people keep accumulating and not spending and sean quickly referenced that the school said we're actually not going to spend it was in the eighty-five thousand range we're giving it back to you and we can put it into this budget has this innovation that we've been hit with prices of an equipment purchase that were higher than we thought they would because everything's so volatile so we did the repurpose of money into this fund that could adjust we think it's going to be this amount of money but it turns out it's more otherwise it'd have to come back to the council and ask for a special appropriation to pull it out so the team has been quite remarkable and on inventory it's i think it would be worth what, what i had my hand up for andy is scheduling a time maybe with the finance committee again posted as a council the inventory talks about properties we own but aren't being used so including demolishing the old hickot hickscott center I've had a long time question on what is our plan for those because they're on some of them are on land that could be sold some aren't um, and I don't have a list, but we now have a pretty good look at how many vehicles do we have already how old are they what's the mileage on them. The one request we had this year and Sean said they'll figure out a way of doing it is it's hard to tell if we're buying a new half ton truck or backup. Is it replacing one that we already have you know so the matching them by types um you know and are we really selling them off so we had a presentation they are they found a place that will buy our used stuff um <laughs> and so we don't just my sense was for a while in vehicles we just had them in a lot and they were the spare vehicle that somebody could drive um because we ensure them, but that inventory is a really good look at, you know, being able to go go forward. And it does hit all the things we talked about in the Finance Committee in terms of trying to capture things that can be updated on a regular basis, but have some meaning to them. So Anna, Anna had a few suggestions on conservation. Um, you know, we're getting on the town buildings the utility costs and some of the other things we don't see that on the school buildings, but they have it so we we talked about trying to expand that look of how expensive are our buildings to run to hold, to heat to. So I just think the the process every year has gotten better and it allows the discussions to be a very focused on a few things, rather than. Um, the first time I saw JCP the requests were more than double the amount of money that we had to spend it was like what do we do it and they were all top priority now it's already staff has really worked hard at coming in at a target and it's been kudos to you paul sonia sean what you're doing with the department heads it's been a gift and very creative i think and responsive so thank you just if i I'd just like to i mean it's really on feedback coming from the council and from the finance committee that helps us improve it so as you think about things what would be helpful to the public and to you and your decision making that helps us build a better document so it's re really based on the feedback that you're giving us i want to get to lynn because i know you have to leave soon yeah i i just want to mention that and and ask that we come to some guidance on this, okay? There are a couple of really large questions that are out there right now. And as we move forward with this budget um, and different department heads come before us, uh, let me just give the example of one of the two I have in mind, library. So, Last night at the town council, there was a, a request for some kind of an update, even though I've been very clear, the council has already allocated or voted 
a, an amount of money for the library and that is our, our bottom line. Uh, people as they're hearing about, you know, increased building costs and so forth and so on. Um, so as the library comes forward to us, questions like um, shelving for the collection uh, are going to be coming up in terms of, you know, what in the present building will you be able to save and use over and how does that fit in with cost run? And I think we need to decide, are we going to have a conversation during this budget month in the finance committee about the library building or are we not? Okay. So, cause we're, we keep running around it, skirting it. Okay. Another one that we're running around a little bit further in the distance and skirting is we may, we will have a empty school building and what are we going to use it for? And there, and should we, or should we be not investing improvements in these buildings so that they might be usable in the future? For example, if we're gonna to have to have a roof on a building in order to even use it for something down the road other than a school. So I think we just need to set the parameters around the discussions um, so that we make sure that we end up at the end of the month of May having been able to recommend a budget for operating and for capital. Um, for this year to the council and yet recognize that various counselors and other members of the finance committee and absolutely the staff are thinking down the road as, as well and trying to think about this budget in the seat of the bigger fiscal picture. And so I just want to make sure, Andy, that you and or you and I decide we're going to have that discussion here or we're going to have it at the council or we're not going to have it. OK. Thank, and, you. Uh, thank you for bringing that up. And I thought about it similarly uh, when uh, Paul mentioned uh, the Southeast School of Summit, former Summit Academy and uh, the you know, if we put money into that building, um, for what purpose are we putting the money in? How long is it gonna take? There's just a lot of questions that flow out of that decision. And if we make the decision to stabilize the Summit Academy, how long would it take to get it done? And um, then what's the, um, how's the decision made between that being the best building or, the elementary school that is not going to be the site of the new proposed building. So it, I think that there are a lot of uh, long-term issues to think about. Um, anything else, Lynn, since you have to go that you want to hit on before you do? Otherwise, I'm going to call on Matt. Okay, Matt. Thanks, Andy. Um, no, I just want to thank Lynn for for bringing that up. And I, you know, this conversation for this month, it feels like we're going into a very intense series of discussions. You know, obviously, you all have been through this much much more than I have. But the, you know, if I can just narrow it a little bit further for finance, I, I, um, some of the things that Kathy indicated about the elementary school building project bottom line number gave me a little bit of a chill. You know, and just and just I just wanting to know that that we have. We're, we're somewhat confident in the in the bottom line borrowing numbers that we're putting on, particularly in, in this in this um, capital program. You know, I, I think that that's something that, you know, we may not be able to figure out the the entirety of what old buildings are going to be used for what purpose. But I think having bottom line numbers for for the borrowing as best we can, I understand is a lot of a lot of variables, but as best we can, that that's something that I, I would feel. I would appreciate, and I don't know if that means that, for example, the ESBC comes and, you know, and, and sort of speaks to just what the, con or not the whole thing, but maybe Kathy just reports out on, on where that stands um, 
but but some of those those bottom line borrowing numbers would be it'd be nice to just know that we 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 had confidence in those and and Sean and Paul maybe maybe you you all do and and I'm just you know <laughs> please yeah is it okay if I respond to that Andy sure so I'll just say based on what we've heard so far it's going to be more um, the the forty million that's in the plan that was based on our based on the last time we did the analysis based on what we've um, been hearing from the MSBA and from our designers and the construction costs, it's going to be more. Um, how much more is sort of what we're still, you know, we've got a range, but it's a pretty, you know, it's probably a $10 million range. Um, so that number will change. Um, the proposal, at least, uh, at least the plan so far has, um, a, you know, earmarked that project to be a debt exclusion. Um, so one of the important things is to find out if the borrowing goes up what does that mean in terms of the debt exclusion amount and what does that mean for taxpayers um the one silver lining um if the debt exclusion amount goes up um is that there has been quite a bit of development since the last time we did the analysis as well so the tax base is is broader um than it was a couple of years ago so the um sort of the impact or the the increase on an annual basis um may not go up proportionally from what we projected last time because the tax base is brought in a little bit. Um, but it, I can just, you know, just to get that elephant out of the room, it is gonna be higher um, than the 40 million. And Sean, uh, and if I can just respond real quick, I just, I also wanted to thank thank you guys for, for using, I'm a very conservative, right? The new growth is, is set at 650 over multiple years. And I think that's safe to say that's a conservative um, number and I appreciated that. So I want to look for other questions about the capital improvement plan proposal now because otherwise um, I'm going to move it. I, I think I want to see if there's any public comment being offered. I'll just tell you, you know where we're we're going. Um, water sewer rates optional tax exemptions and try and get all of this done by 11 o'clock so we can hit the two hour goal this time. Um, Bob? Yeah, I just wanted to uh, thank uh, Paul and Sean and Sonia and the, and the staff for putting together these documents. I mean, these are very well, uh, very well planned out documents and they're full of information and they really give us the chance to look at things and ask, ask questions. And I really appreciate it. And I think it's incredibly uh, valuable that we do this or that we have these documents every year. So thanks. Okay, anything else? I think the one thing that I'll just bring up um, and then I'm going to, if there's nothing else from the committee, I'm going to see if there's um, offer the public opportunity to make public comment. Um, and that is that, uh, you know, a big driver of capital, both in the expense and in assessing the needs, we've already touched on several different times and that's buildings. And uh, I guess at some point during this, uh, you know, I, before we get to next year's process, I'd like to give some real thought to what we need to know about buildings and um, how to approach the inventory need for what repairs are needed on buildings, both ones that are not in use, but more importantly to my mind, ones that are in use so that uh, I, we get a firm understanding. And JCPC may have a better grasp on it than the rest of us do because uh, you, know, you lived with it through the JCPC process. Um, so is there anything else on uh, from the committee? And if not, I wanna um, offer public comment period. And um, so if there's any members of the public who wish to participate in public comment, um, they should please raise their hands and uh, we'll have them brought into the uh, meeting and uh, people and so that they can make uh, where we usually allot us uh, 
about three minutes or so to make comments. So at this point, I've not seen anybody raise their hand. Um, so, um, wait a minute. I, now I do see a hand up, so I have to go see who it is. Um, Di Shabazz. Um, can, hi, Di. Uh, can you unmute? Hello? Can you all yes. hear me? Yes, I can. Yes. So um, thank you. I wanted to um, talk about the Youth Empowerment Center and um, to once again remind this body, uh, the Finance Committee and Town Council members and the town manager, that this was part of the uh, work of the CSWG. And um, this was something, of course, that came out of the racial reckoning that occurred and the conversations with the community. What I don't want us to lose sight of as you juggle all of these many uh, projects is that the uh, demographics pertaining to who is enrolled in our schools has become much more diverse, much more multilingual, and making sure that the values of this community is expressed through the budget to both support and empower our youth is not only a worthwhile thing to do, it is building to a necessary thing to do. And so I don't want us to lose sight of it we as the community have not lost sight of it, and we will be uh, watching and both vocal and engaged uh, in talking about this budget and how it reflects our values. So thank you again. And thank you, Dee, I appreciate the comment. Um, so anything else from the committee and otherwise I'm gonna uh, turn it back to either Sean or Paul or Sonia to uh, uh, just present the uh, water and sewer rate proposal for FY23. Is it okay if I um, share my screen again, Andy? Certainly. All right, so... Um... Just to recap, the proposal for FY23 is to increase uh, the water rate from $4.60 per 100 cubic foot um, to four seventy five, dollars which is a 3.3% increase. On the sewer side, the proposal is to increase from $4.90 uh, per 100 cubic feet um, to $5.20, which is a 6.1% increase. Um, I won't go over all of this because I, um, you can take a look at it if you want, but I'll just go over the the tables in a little more detail. Um, so the way we look at rates and um, and what they need to be is, is we start by looking at the expenses of our enterprise funds, and in this case, particularly water and sewer. Um, so we we look at what our rates or what our expenses are currently. Um, we build in you know what the staffing costs are, what our pension costs are for those staff, um, other post employment benefits, uh, you know contributions they make towards that health insurance, really every cost um, associated uh, directly with the enterprise fund are built in. And then we project that out several years into the future as well. Um, on top of that, we add in capital. So there's a certain amount for capital every year um, because we know on an annual basis, there's gonna be some uh, pipes that may, may, might need to be repaired. They, they have equipment and vehicles. Um, so there's sort of a recurring amount of capital. Um, and then if there's large capital projects like uh, what was approved uh, a year or two ago with Centennial that are uh, financed, the debt for those large projects are factored in as well. So um, all that's put in, the next variable that we then need to look at 
is consumption and how much water is projected to be used because that um, will dictate how we cover those expenses that we just quantified, you know, how we spread that across the, cons the consumption levels. Um, so during the pandemic, we saw a drop in consumption, which was one reason why rates got boosted up um, more rapidly than we would have liked. Um, we're seeing consumption levels return uh, somewhat, but there is still uncertainty around future consumption levels. So just as we look at this, um, as we look at this table, um, so there's the, the operating ex expenses right here that I was just describing. So um, these are, again, things like staffing, um, health insurance, things of that nature. Um, transfers to the general fund. So the uh, one cost that I mentioned last night is that the enterprise funds pay a fee to the general fund for all the overhead that the general fund provides to them. So um, things like human resources, IT support, payroll, accounts payable, all those um, sort of town hall type functions, um, they pay an indirect fee for that. And there's a formula that's used to calculate that fee. So that's what this transfer to general fund line is. And then there's the uh, current debt that I described um, and proposed debt. So current debt includes Centennial because again, that, that project has been authorized already and approved. So it's the, the schedule that we anticipate is, is in this current debt number. Um, and then the capital. So this would be the sort of recurring uh, new project capital, not, fun, not funded through debt, just whatever is that year. So that determines sort of the total amount that we need. So for FY23, um, we need about 4.86 million. Um, and with the usage that we've projected, which is 1,025,100 cubic feet, that would set a rate of the 475 that's being proposed. Um, and again, you can see how that plays out in the future. So when we look out in the future for the water fund, um, we get, you know, five years in, we're sort of where we need to be around 550, unless there's other changes, you know, as the council talks about water and sewer regs and things like that, that has the potential to impact the trajectory of expenses. Um, but over five years, we get to where we need to be. It might be a little, um, there might be need to be some adjustments in these interim years because you can see there's a little uh, there's a deficit in a couple of these years in FY24, um, you know, a, a reasonably large deficit that we would have to close um, either through higher rates or reduced expenses um, or if consumption picks up faster. Um, and then the last thing I'll point out on this chart is um, we retained earnings, so enterprise funds have their own reserve levels. Um, which are also outlined in our financial policies now that we've, uh, the ones that we reviewed a finance committee. So for the water fund, they have about 1.4 million in reserves, which is about 30%. Um, for enterprise funds, we have a higher percentage threshold that we look to maintain because um, it's a smaller fund and the, the revenues are more volatile, especially as we saw during the pandemic, they can be really volatile. Um, so the threshold that we wanna maintain for enterprise funds, I think we set it somewhere between 30 and 50%. So we're sort of at the low end um, for water. Um, we were over 30%, but we had to dip into these reserves during the pandemic. Um, and again, we're, we're not proposing using any reserves going forward. So um, we hope to build that number back into that range of 30 to 50%. Same thing on the sewer side, um, all the same types of expenses. Uh, there, there's two large capital projects there as well. There's the gravity belt and the reuse water project. So that debt is factored in in the future. Um, consumption is, is we projected as a factor of the water consumption. So it's, um, it's somewhere between 85 and 90% in a given year, it fluctuates a little bit. Um, but same thing here over five years, uh, you know, we're projecting where the rate needs to go in order to support the debt when it gets to its highest point. Um, but the path we take to get there, there might need to be some adjustments in order to get the fund in balance. And I think I'll stop there and see if there's questions. Yeah, I have one and then I see two hands up. So I want to get to the, um, others. Uh, in the proposed state grant program, this gets back to water. Um, there was a listing uh, by town that uh, was an attachment to one of the MMA um, emails that I received recently. And it listed um, our request for Centennial as being um, a significant dollar amount that would be included. And is that factored into um, the calculations now? And if we receive those funds, 
um, um, and it's not calculated in how it, how these charts change. I wish, Andy. Um, so, uh, so Centennial's, you know, like everything else, the project is the cost of the project has come in much higher because of what's going on in the in the industry. Um, so, what we have factored in is what the council has authorized, which is about um, twelve million total. There was uh, eleven million for the construction, and there was a million, I think, for engineering prior to that. Um, so, we have twelve million built into these rates. Uh, the cost estimates are, you know, north of fifteen million. Uh, that the most recent cost estimates because of, um, you know, we recently went through this line by line with Guilford looking at the cost of steel and um, concrete, um, the equipment that goes into the plant. Um, so we've been looking at this very closely recently. So there's a lot of work that we have to do just to get the project or that the cost of the town back to that 12 million. Um, so that funding that you described, um, we're still looking into, and Paul, maybe you've heard more, we're still looking into determine is, is that money in hand that we have now, or is that a proposal? Uh, and to make see if, if that is money that we have. Um, but that money, it was about three and a half million that was in the, it was basically a listing of, um, from the, that the governor has put forward, of, I think ARPA money, it sounded like, um, that would fund different projects that have been requested in the past. And it was about three and a half million for us. So that would go a long way towards getting us back towards um, the, the number that the council authorized. Uh, and then the other program that we're looking at, and we'd have to see how this would work in conjunction with um, what the governor uh, put forward, um, is the state, the Clean Water State Revolving Fund, um, which they help finance the project, and then there's some loan forgiveness. And so if we're able to take advantage of both of those, or the, the grant money from the governor and also the State House Revolving uh, Program with the loan forgiveness, um, that would be very close to getting us back to the amount authorized by the council, but we're still doing our due diligence to see, um, is that money from the governor, you know, real? Do we have it? Um, and we, we still have to find out if we're in the state house revolving program. So there's, there's still a lot of work to be done on that. So these numbers, again, are based on what the council's authorized, the, the 12 million. Yeah, so, so the, we saw the same list and we have not received any formal notification from the state. This looked to be a governor's proposal. We had put in seeking funds thinking that this would be when we put in the uh, the proposal they were looking for projects that would promote economic development and uh, were shovel ready and we thought centennial was pretty compelling at that level it didn't get funded in the initial run round but then it get, did get picked up in this round when they decided to put out this big economic development package so we were pleased about that because it's a big chunk of dough but again i think this is the governor's proposal how it works its way through the state house i'm not really sure Thank you, Pam. Yeah, thanks. Uh, that answered one of my questions is, could the rate be reduced if, if those grants are um, uh, visualized? And the answer is no, because we've already projected just at the, at the basic cost of 12 million for the project. A um, Couple other questions. Does the, does the rate that you're projecting, uh, is it based on full use or restoration of full use by UMass? Uh, is that accounted for in this rate? Mm -hmm. um, another question is, what is what is the pressure put? How how does one put pressure on enterprise funds to actually come forward with the lowest cost since the cost is what drives the rate? Um, how do we? How do we keep pressure on them to keep the cost down? Um, since it's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy, if you need more money, you, you raise your rate. Um, and then, uh, let's see. The other question was, um, oh, you talked about the you talked about the assessment rate for overhead, and are the enterprise funds treated it differently than other departments in terms of their assessment for? all the, you know, the HR and overhead costs. Yeah, um, so I'll start with the last one. So yeah, enterprise funds are, oh, sorry, go ahead. Another one? On that, on that last one, I mean, are they charged based on, on their income or are they charged based on their number of employees? Um, maybe I'll bring Holly in the room. She can probably speak best to the, uh, to how that works, but it's based on the, um, I believe it's a percentage of administrative costs is assigned to them. Um, let's see if she joins. But 
um, they are treated differently than departments that we don't assign overhead costs to like fire department or the um, police department because they're they're part of the town budget part of the general fund budget so they're just in our budget enterprise funds um, are supposed to be completely self-sustaining and supported by the fees that they charge so that's why there are indirect costs calculated for them because they are really supposed to be standalone um, and I think the um, uh, let's see. What was, what was the second the second question you had? Sorry, it was on the tip of my tongue. Um, uh, is UMass? Uh, are you accounting for a full return of UMass consumption? We are rate? counting. So we are counting for that. Um, sorry, there was a. What was the question after that? There was one more in between there. <laughs> uh, the one that was already answered was: Could we reduce our rate by obtaining grants? Oh, okay. Um, so, so that was a conversation we um, we had with Guilford recently as well. Um, so, with enterprise funds, particularly water, the the incremental pieces where they can reduce costs are based on our water sources. So, a lot of their costs are related to maintaining, uh, I think, it, I don't know, six, five or six different major water sources. And so, the the area where they could take a big step down in their costs would be if we were to give up one of those water sources. We've been reluctant to do that because water is such a, a precious uh, resource and it, once you give it up, it's really hard to get it back. Um, but that would be sort of the decision point is if, if we said we don't want one of these wells or if we don't want one of these major treatment plants, you know, let it go, um, that would have a dramatic impact on costs. But again, we would lose that likely for, you know, for the foreseeable future. So um, I think that's one of the hard things about enterprise funds is it's, it's a lot of infrastructure, it's maintaining infrastructure, um, regardless of how much consumption there is. And so the, the costs are not very flexible on the way we'd want to be, you know, we do have some flexibility, we can, you know, we could defer capital, but we try not to do that, but we could defer capital for a year, but then you have to make it up the next year. Um, you know, we had some flexibility with reducing indirect costs for a year, but again, then we need to get back to it in the following year so that, you know, they're on the same system as the other enterprise funds. So, so there's a little bit of flexibility year to year, but um, there's not a ton of variability in the enterprise, particularly the water and sewer fund um, because of the, the infrastructure they have to maintain. I just want to add in that our, our two largest customers are the university and Amherst College. So this is the one way where they able, they're they able to support the town based on their usage, um, as opposed to a strategic partnership agreement. It's a service that they purchase. Um, and so that helps our overall uh, capacity to provide these services. Right. And unfortunately, um, you know, this is a conversation we've had recently, we all want to conserve. Um, conservation is good. Um, but the flip side of that is as we conserve, it drives up the rate because um, <laughs> there's, there's, less to, there's less to spread it over. So again, that it gets into that long-term conversation about um, where do we want to be with our, our water resources. Kathy? Thanks. Uh, actually, Andy and Pam both asked a couple of my questions on uh, if we get that money for Centennial, uh, what happens to rates? So I'll flip it. If we don't get the money from the governor, what's the plan? I mean, the uh, and I don't need an answer for that right now. I just, what I remember on Centennial is we'd gone through the entire budget. We'd gone through the entire rates, put it to bed in May. And in June, we found out about $11 million from Centennial and it was, uh, oops, forgot to mention that. Um, so I just, you know, planning for that. My, my question when I'm looking at um, the budget with the reserves retained, Sean, you talked about why the percentages are as high as they are. And what I remember asking, but I don't know whether we got answered, is this fairly typical? We're up in the 29, 30% um, retained. And did we ever go out and look at uh, what other towns do? Because the thing that's notable about it is that we're not drawing down on them either. So up on the upper line, it says, you know, how much did we pull down on retained earnings? And it's zero, 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 zero. Mm -hmm. So it's, it, that's a question. Then the other question, it's a little bit more minor, but when we had a discussion about Centennial and the purchase price. There was a question of what is the utility costs of the plant? And it turned out it was extremely high. 
um, the end, the operating budget was really high electrical. So we were looking at, was there solar? Was there anything to offset? And that was supposed to be looked at in the design phase of, it wasn't a yes, no, it was more of a, can you please take a look at it? I didn't know whether that was ever done um, on a offsetting the, the utility draw that was, it's a pretty high expense. You know, I'm remembering it being in the hundreds of thousands of dollars rather than just 20,000. Um, so that's underneath some of these rates. So that was the last question I had. First on the retained earning percentages and comparables and what happens if we don't get three and a half million, so. Yeah, so if we don't get the additional funds for Centennial, um, so we have been working with Gilbert to find ways to reduce costs. Um, so from things like trying to do the project management ourselves might save some cost, um, and, and just looking through going line by line to find out if there's ways that we could, could get that number down. Um, we're not going to get it down all the way to you know six million dollars or, or seven million dollars, whatever, or five million dollars, whatever it is. Um, so if if we just if we proceed with that project, we would have to come back to the council for an additional authorization. Um, to increase the amount uh, that can be borrowed. And then that would be built into these rates going forward. Um, the project is gonna take a couple of years. So it's still, you know, it's it's a, kind of a couple of years away in terms of when the, the big impact will hit, but it'll start to phase in in the future. Um, the reserve level. So we did look at other communities. Um, we based our reserve level on, so what happens if we had a reduction in revenues for a couple of years, how, you know, what type of retained earnings would we need in order to survive? Um, a recession or something like we just went through a pandemic where we lost a lot of revenue. Um, so that's sort of what guided our level is looking at our experience and and what we would need to get through a rough patch. Um, again, 30 to 50% sounds like a lot, but on a $4 million or $5 million budget, um, it's not really all that much if you had a couple down years like we just had with the pandemic. Um, we're not proposing using in the future because we treat this like we treat any other budget, which is we don't want it to be dependent on reserves. We want it to be self-sustaining and, and sort of in a good place going forward. Um, that being said, I wouldn't be surprised if, if we dip into those reserves again this year um, with, uh, if, with consumption levels being a little down. Um, so we don't want to tap into reserves. We want it to kind of stay in that range and, and live there. Um, but I wouldn't be surprised if we dip into that a little bit more uh, for FY22. Um, and again, water is the fund that we can't use ARPA. So we used ARPA to support the sewer fund and the transportation fund. When they had down years, water fund, for whatever reason, was a carve out and the ARPA um, that you couldn't use ARPA to backfill the, the, rev, the reserves there. Um, and then the last question on, on utility costs. You're right. I mean, water and sewer, I, I don't know if it's 50%, but it's a huge percentage of the total town's electricity usage is from wastewater and the water plant. Um, they are the major users of electricity because they're 24 seven and they have all the heavy equipment. Um, so I know they've talked about solar there. Um, I know there were some, some um, obstacles that, that Guilford would be able to describe better, um, but whether it's on site or off site, if we're gonna cover the town's electricity consumption with solar or some other means, um, we're gonna have to, to tackle those two, those locations. Okay, um, I see that Michelle's hands up, but uh, I think there are a couple things. One is on the solar, I think that some of the problem was that uh, the plant is in Pelham and Pelham has a solar bylaw for um, which we're aspiring to have our one for ourselves, but uh, whether uh, we would be able to obtain permission from Pelham, according to their solar bylaw, is really an unknown. I don't know if anybody spent any time on it. And the other thing that, um, and this is something that I'm just going to say so that it can be in a little bit in the minutes and then I can incorporate it in the report, it doesn't really need discussion, but uh, new councillors, uh, newly elected councillors weren't involved in the prior discussion. And uh, there was a very important piece to this, which was that um, there are three major sources of water 
in Amherst, and one of them is the whole system of reservoirs in Pelham. And uh, the um, it's not currently in use because the Centennial plant is unusable. And there was a time limit um, that if we don't get the plant back online, then uh, we were told that we couldn't continue um, the state was telling us that we couldn't continue to use the Pelham water area, that there was a permit that went with it. Um, Amy or uh, Guilford were, uh, are the better explainers of that if need be, but uh, it, was, it was an important element to maintain all of our sources of water in order to assure adequacy of supply for the future that we maintain permission to use the uh, Pelham area and that uh, repairing the Centennial plant was uh, a required piece in order to do that. And there was a time limit involved. I don't know if Paul or uh, Sean have anything to add to that, but it's just I want to get the concept out. Uh, Michelle, see your hands up. That's helpful. Thank you, Andy. Um, I see a note in this presentation about alternative rate structures that are being explored, and I'm just wondering if you could say a few words about that. Yeah, um, so Kathy and Bernie are on a, have been working with myself and uh, Paul and Guilford and Amy um, to look at some Op other options for billing, um, looking at things like higher um, sort of fixed costs or meter costs, uh, and ones that vary based on the size of the meter, um, and also looking at potentially um, block rates or, or tiered rates based on consumption levels. Um, and so we are at the phase of we have uh, accumulated lots of data from pre the uh, prior to the pandemic, um, sort of account by account of what their consumption was for a year um, so that we can then take that data and apply different structures to it to see how that would affect charges um, because what we're what they're looking at will it won't necessarily I, it could increase revenue but it, it may just redistribute revenue um, as to who pays it and so we want to get a sense of what it does to different accounts um, and so right now again the data has been compiled it's with Guilford and Amy and, and the team over there um, to to uh, to start getting ready to apply those different structures to it. Thanks. Hey Jennifer. Um, yeah, this is getting. I, I'm returning um, to uh, Dr. Shabazz's comment. Guess I touched on it a little last night in the council meeting, but I, I just want some clarification in terms of the assessment that's being done for the Youth Empowerment Center. Is that an assessment as to like the location or is it more whether there's a need for that? Because one seems like it's appropriate for the budget and the other seems like it's a different conversation. Uh, so it is a need assessment, not a location assessment. It is a need assessment. So it's the, um, the rec director working with um, the different partners in the community who um, provide services to the youth, whether it be the school department, um, the Boys and Girls Club, um, to, to identify where the gaps are. Um, I think one of the proposals for the Youth Empowerment Center is that there's gaps in the services provided to children. Um, and so we're, our recreation director is working with those partners to start digging into that more. So um, is this, I know the CSWG doesn't exist in that form, but will will they be part of the conversation? I mean, yeah, I think the I mean, so it I, seems that so, they, sh they should be. So I think the rec director want, um, you know, maybe we, you know, we can talk with the rec director more and bring him, uh, get an update for the committee at some point. Um, but I believe he's going to be working with all different types of stakeholders, um, wants to survey children, wants to bring in families, um, you know, speak directly with um, the, the constituencies that would be impacted by this to kind of to do that needs assessment. So I believe stakeholder input and stakeholders or partnering with stakeholders is going to be um, a key part of that needs assessment. 
Okay. And if I could just uh, jump on that, Andy. Um, so there is a successor committee to the CSWG called the Community Safety and Social Justice Committee. Once that is up and running, which we hope will, they'll have their first meeting in the next couple of weeks, once we're able to get everybody together, um, they will be part of looking at all the recommendations from the CSWG and seeing their the disposition of how those are moving forward. Okay, thank you. Good. I need, I'm just conscious of time, so I'm trying to move things along now. Anna? Sure. So just to clarify then, when you say needs assessment, it's not the need for this to exist because the, in my mind, the, the CSWG worked very, very hard for a very long time to establish why this needs to exist. A needs assessment, in, for me, what I would like to see is much more of, we know we need this in existence. The, the assessment is to determine what are the components within it that weren't specified by CSWG. Because for me, it feels very redundant to spend so much money on a needs assessment when we just had an amazing community committee go through for however many months to determine that we need this. Um, and so I'm not negating the need for that sort of assessment as long as it's much more about what are the resources and, and um, services and, and things that we need within it versus do we need this at all? That's Uh, Jennifer, here. I just want to say I, I agree with Anna. She art articulated what I was getting at. Thank you. Okay, Michelle. I want to back that as well. I, I it really does feel redundant. Um, I want to go back and look at the report that CSWG put together and the recommendations and the way they were laid out, but. I it, I just, I have concerns that there's a $500,000 allocation for something that seems like it was already done um, and that it just doesn't seem very clear what that money is being used for. And it's a lot of money. Um, so I would really appreciate um, more information about that um, in the very near future. So thanks. Okay, um, and Alicia? Um, yeah, so I also just want to go on that and not repeat too much of what other people said, but to also just say that I agree and that the CSWG also got a lot of pushback on the amount of money we spent on our consultants to help us come to this decision. So it is a bit frustrating to see more money being spent to look at the same thing that we were criticized for spending so much money on. Um, and so that I would hope that all of this money could just be used to moving it forward rather than more investigation, which was already <clears throat> done. Um, and then I also would be just interested in like, again, which stakeholders they're communicating with, because we also worked with the Boys and Girls Club and they don't have a space or facility, which is just, there, there aren't, those resources don't exist. And so I'm hoping we can just use this money to move it forward rather than provide any more investigation, I guess is the basis of what I'm getting at. And so I'd be interested in seeing like a more thorough plan. If we could speak with the rec director, that would be great. Or as to what the approach is with this. Well, I wanna thank all, all of you for the comments and what I will probably do now is work with Sean to figure out what is the best way to talk about this budget item, when to replace the, have the continued discussion, make sure that that's reported to the council as a whole, since several of you who spoke were uh, not members of the committee, a couple of you were, uh, but I want to make sure that everybody's aware of how, uh, but, but I don't think we can really, um, Get and meet our other needs today to finish the agenda. Um, go farther now, but I'll work with Sean on figuring out when to uh, con continue this discussion. Uh, Sean, you think that works? Yeah, that sounds good. Okay. Um, on the water rates, um, we do have it on the agenda again for the next meeting, so we don't need this. If somebody made a motion right now on water rates, I would uh, entertain the motion, but it's not necessary. I want to at least offer that opportunity uh, since we've had a pretty good discussion about uh, both water and sewer rates um, for FY23, and we do need to... Um, 
get a recommendation back to the council though it doesn't have to come out of this meeting and if nobody raises their hand to offer a motion now then we'll, i'm going to make an assumption that we're going to allow that to hang over to the next meeting and just spend the last few minutes um, to see if there are any questions about the optional tax exemptions which is the last item on the agenda for today's meeting uh, so since no hands have gone up um, i don't know if sean or paul if you have anything to say or sonia about uh, the annual um, requirement of the optional tax exemption i think that you already provided the council in the in through the council to the to the entire finance committee uh, the information about why we have the optional tax exemptions and why that's required as a uh, action each year. Yeah. Um, so in in the packet was a memo. So this is um, a choice the town has made to increase the um, exemption levels provided to certain types of qualifying um, uh, taxpayers um, above sort of a base exemption amount, and so. Um, the the uh, eligible categories are uh, surviving spouses of veterans, uh, disabled veterans, um, surviving parents and spouses, uh, legally blind, and seniors. Um, and there's you know there's some additional qualifications within there. But um, this is something I believe the town has done. I don't know for how many years, but for quite some time um, to extend some additional tax relief to those groups. Kathy. On, on this issue, I would be ready to make a motion that we recommend that the town, the council approve these. Um, they are what we've approved in the past. I think they are reasonable and they are needed. Um, I'm glad the town is doing this. So Andy, I know we're short on time, but on this one, I'm ready to move this to a vote unless people wanna have a longer discussion. Just for the framing of the motion uh, itself, uh, do we have a proposed order on this? Yeah, um, yeah, FY 23-11. So I guess the motion would be um, in terms of the finance committee uh, recommending to the council that it adopt order 23-11. And, and the rest of it is acceptance of optional tax exemption. It's part of the title. So we have we have the memo, the one page memo with that at the top, just to make it clear what that order is. So I I move as Andy just said. I'll second that. <laughs> okay, so we have a motion made by Kathy, seconded by Michelle. Any further discussion on the motion or questions about it? Hearing none, then uh, um, I'm going to go through alphabetically by last name and uh, either get a vote or support for the people who are uh, uh, non-voting members. Uh, Lynn is no longer in the meeting, uh, so she will show up as absent in the discussion. Uh, Bob Hegner? Uh, yes, support. Yeah. Uh, Matt Holloway? Support. Um, Bernie is absent. Michelle? Yes. Kathy? Yes. I'm a yes. And uh, Alicia? Yes. OK, so that motion passes four in favor, one member absent. Uh, resident members two in support and one member absent. And uh, that'll be reflected in the minutes. Um, so I have nothing that was unanticipated. I haven't seen anything else that's come up as um, unless somebody else has an unanticipated item that they would like to bring forward. And if not, um, I want to thank everybody uh, and our Next meeting, I believe, is a week from today. And, and before you close, I need to adjourn the council. Yeah. Um, 
So I was going to, um, why don't you go ahead and adjourn the council and then I'll adjourn the committee and uh, we're done. I'm just, just trying to make sure we got to a logical conclusion. And I think we have, uh, so Anna. All right, I am hereby adjourning the council at 11.01 a.m. And I am adjourning the finance committee at 11.01 a.m. And I want to thank all of you and thank our um, for Paul and Sean and uh, Thane and Bill and uh, Sonia all for helping us out. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. Thanks, everybody. Bye.